my name is Abhinash Advani. I am the Director of Business Strategy at Starlink. And essentially my role at the organization um, is revolving around anything strategic. So strategic partners, strategic vendors, strategic expansion, and of course, most importantly, strategic customers. Um, from a Starlink perspective, the company is what we call today a true value-added distributor. The company was founded in 2005, so it's almost now nine years, and our business model has been security value added distribution from the beginning. Now, in terms of security, IT security is a very big field. So Starlink's forte and Starlink's strength is actually a niche IT security distribution, not just IT security distribution. So over the last nine years, the company has grown dramatically from two people that founded the company to today over 85 people that span 14 countries uh, with on the ground teams in each of those countries. Uh, the company is quite unique because it has a very different value added distribution business model than typical uh, VADs in the industry. Um, the reason why it's different is because we believe that in order to effectively give the vendor what they require especially when they're a niche vendor. It's not possible to do so from our headquarters location, just in Dubai, and span all these countries together. It's critical that there be on the ground presence in each country that we operate in. So today these 85 people span these 14 countries. Many of the countries have existing offices. Seven out of the 14 countries actually have physical offices. Dubai, Riyadh, Istanbul, Johannesburg, Kuwait, Doha, etc. These countries have larger teams, so it justifies having an office. Those countries which have smaller markets or justify having smaller teams, of course don't have an office, but the employees are on the ground and they work from home. Furthermore, what's really unique about Starlink is that from a value-added distribution standpoint, we only and always work through the channel, as a true VAT would do. But because our portfolio is primarily niche security focused, it's extremely important that at the same time as building the channel for a specific vendor that we take on or that enters the market for the first time, it's also very important to develop the market side by side with the vendor at the same time as developing the channel. This allows us to be an extension of the vendor's team. Because if you look today at many of the vendors in our portfolio, they don't have local presence. I mean, of course, some of them do, like the IDMs and the Dell Quest and the SafeNet and the FireEyes, but many of the vendors don't have local presence. So we act as an extension of their teams. And how we act as an extension of their teams is that we go and we develop the channel for them, of course, because we have over 55 channel partners across these 14 countries that work with us. But we have these on-the-ground teams that provide end-to-end -end services from sales to marketing to lead generation all the way to pre-sales activities, implementation services and support. Now some look at this and say, well, isn't this the job of the reseller? Absolutely yes. It is once the channel is ready. So what we do is we support the channel to become ready, but at the same time, so as to not lose a lot of uh, initial time to develop the market, we go to the market directly with our on-the-ground country teams. But in all cases, even if we develop opportunities to close them, we bring the channel in at the end to fulfill the order because we don't sell direct since we are a VAD. Now, what's again interesting to look at is when a vendor comes in for the first time, we call this the high touch model, where Starling does the majority of the work and the partner we bring in close to the end of the sales life cycle. As the vendor matures and the market presence and proliferation of that vendor's technology gets into the market, it moves to a mid-touch model. Mid-touch meaning the channel is developed now. The, they are going to market and developing opportunities. So Starlink's role is to go side by side with the channel to help them close and develop opportunities. As that product becomes mature and you know starts uh, becoming very prolific across the market, the need for Starlink to go direct becomes less even further. And it becomes a low-touch model, where the partner drives the opportunities completely and Starlink functions more in a traditional value-added distribution role, where we of course provide credit and logistics, but also resources when the partner requires it. So this transition, this progression from high-touch to mid-touch to low-touch, this is really what we pride ourselves on. 
and many vendors look to join our portfolio because of this because they feel that we have the ability to not only create a channel for them but simultaneously create a market share for them without having to wait for the channel to be ready so this is what we call true value added distribution from an internal team perspective there's also a concept that we greatly pride ourselves on which is how we structure our teams the on the ground country teams have sales functions pre-sales functions implementation and support functions and of course led by a country manager at the same time every single product in Starlink's portfolio has a product manager associated with it now those product managers they report into me and what we do is we drive that product strategy so while the country teams are focusing on building the revenue for that country those teams are split by product area within the country to ensure that each product gets the focus it deserves within that country but simultaneously the product managers who are managing the uh, vendors portfolio or the vendors product in this market are responsible and required to take that vendor forward they have four major functions within their responsibilities one is to carry that vendors target so if vendor A has five million dollars that needs to be achieved in our territory they are carrying that target and they make sure that the channel partners and the country teams achieve that target the product managers are responsible for marketing coordination they are responsible for training and development activities and of course channel development and management so putting these together product management focused on each vendor country teams focused on that local country but split by product we are able to effectively achieve what we call true value added distribution if you look at Starling's portfolio it's actually segmented and split into three areas core emerging and growth now core emerging and growth is, is exactly mapped to high mid low core is in the low touch emerging is in the mid touch and growth is in the high touch so if you look at the growth portfolio it's primarily new vendors or new technologies that have recently been added or recently come into region that we are distributing so of course the efforts that we have are going to be much more to take those vendors to market such as Venify, Red Seal, Core Security, Bit9 these are in the growth space if you look at the emerging space these are vendors that have actually been in the region now for a couple of years they've got an existing customer base partners know about these vendors and you know we're going side by side so it's mid touch you have net optics bull server um, you know app scan you got several vendors that have now been in the market for a while that partners know about that we're taking forward in the core area we're talking about IBM Guardian Dell Quest FireEye SafeNet okay Tripwire now these products and solutions have been you know in the region for several years now they're doing multi-million dollar of business already and we have been you know obviously helping them grow in the region taking an example of Guardian Guardian was we were the distributor for Guardian before it was acquired by IBM before anybody knew what database auditing and monitoring was in the region we brought that concept here today we have over 75 customers primarily spanning the banking and finance uh, telco government oil and gas sectors that are using Guardian and the truth is that IBM acquired them and we've taken them even further so this is a clear example today of how we took a product that was unknown from a high touch model into today where partners are going to market talking Guardian into a very low touch model of course we still support those partners by doing a lot of work since we know this product extensively but it has definitely moved into low touch another example would be FireEye when FireEye came into the region it had no customers with a couple of employees now the company has also grown rapidly they went public recently they have 23 24 employees on the ground but today there are almost I think over 50 customers today in a year and a half doing almost eight million dollars of revenue by the end of this year because of the value-added services that Starlink has provided now this particular vendor is a good case study because it's been taken from high touch to low touch in 18 months this is what we call our secret story or our you know our, uh, our recipe for success taking a vendor and allowing them to go from zero to you know prolific in 18 months so you know these are a couple there's again Dell Quest similar example the product was EDMZ when we brought it here in 2005 EDMZ was acquired by Quest 
Quest was acquired by Dell. And EDMZ, we have the most customers for in the region. I think it's around the uh, number of 125 or so customers that are privileged password management customers from EDMZ. When they were acquired by Quest, it became TPAM. We continue taking that momentum forward. Today, it's acquired by Dell and is part of the Dell Identity Access Management Portfolio. And again, we are continuing to take it forward. So these are examples of some of the vendors and technologies that we've taken from high touch to low touch and have moved from growth to emerging into the core portfolio. It's a good question, but the simple answer is there's never a conflict of interest because it's always the priority to give the channel partners the services and to give the channel the ability to deliver if they can. For us, we only provide those services if the channel cannot. So if the channel partners have the capacity and are capable to deliver professional services, we always make request them to do so because this is in their best interest and many channel partners do want to provide end-to-end -end services. We as Starlink support the channel, not the customers. Yes, we are available for customer support and so on and so forth if the customer needs, but our role as a true VAD is to support the channel. So there's never a conflict of interest. If there is a channel partner who is selling a particular technology within our portfolio and has the skills to deploy, develop, implement, support that technology, it is always recommended to do that and we would never have conflict with them. Because we say, John, this is a channel partner. Do you have the capacity to do pre-sales, post-sales activities? If so, please charge your services. If not, and you want to use Starlink services, here is the cost of it. Please include it in your proposal to the customer. In all cases, it goes through the channel. So even if they use our services, they're actually reselling our services. It's not that we go direct to the customer. To be, the simple answer is end to end. We have the capacity to provide business development, sales, lead generation services. We have the capability to provide pre-sales, demos, presentation, POCs. We have the capability to provide implementation services. And we have the capability to provide support services. All are being able to, you know, are, all are available for our customer base, sorry, our partner channel base, which of course are our customers. Um, and then they can choose to resell them to the customers if they want, or they can choose to do those services themselves. In large markets, such as Saudi, uh, UAE, Turkey, South Africa, the teams are very large, you know, 18 plus. In such team environments, the teams are locally structured to provide these end-to-end -end services I just shared with you. No dependency on Dubai, or no dependency on the rest of the uh, you know, Starlink team. In smaller markets where there is on-the-ground presence, but maybe less employees, maybe three or five people to, you know, to cover that market. In this scenario, obviously those technical people are certified and capable in, you know, each one carries three or four technologies each, but any technology that they're not able to cover because of uh, you know, not, being an, not having expertise or not being certified, they will then be able to leverage on the whole team structure that Starlink has across 14 countries. So we call this, this is actually a good question because we call this our hybrid team cloud environment. We're taking Starlink's team and putting it into our private cloud. What does this mean? We offer our employees to each of the different countries that we cover on a travel basis. So in Turkey, maybe someone has a project for Venify that the skills are not yet developed in Turkey because the team is, you know, doesn't have a certified engineer yet, but there's one in Dubai. Instantly, the Dubai engineer will be able to cover the Turkey requirements when something comes up in Turkey. So we have a free sort of roaming uh, profile for each technical employee within the company. So we do have a centralized support team that is based in Dubai, okay? But each country also has support engineers. So on-site support, L1 support is always provided, of course, by partners, right? L2 support is then provided by our on-the-ground teams. And L3 support is provided by our central technical assistance center that's headquartered in Dubai, where we have support engineers who support the entire region. And then, of course, you have the next level of support, which goes to the vendor, 
right? Which we will coordinate with through the L3 support team. There definitely is challenge in, you know, for the management team in when we expand into new markets because you have to, as you correctly said, understand the local culture, understand the differences in taxation, differences in customs duties, differences in people, you know, how to manage and uh, uh, the different types of people that we deal with. But what's critical and the success story, again, from example and from history is based on having local teams made up of local people. So if you look at each country, and these 14 countries, they have local people from that country representing those teams. The country manager, for example, of Turkey is Turkish. The country manager of South Africa is South African. You see, so each country's country manager has full knowledge of that market. They come in, they're coming from the same background of IT security, but they are local from that country. So that makes it very easy for us to understand the local market and operate because not only can they provide the feedback required for us to know how to operate there, but moreover, they understand the culture better than us and are able to manage their teams. This avoids the cultural differences that can come up when managing different teams.